Hello, my name is Tia Gordon, and today I'll be talking about transcatheter aortic valve replacement, a sonographer's perspective. I have no disclosures. Today I will discuss a brief history of the TAVR procedure and the clinical trials that brought us to where we are today. I'll go over the procedure and more specifically the echo imaging used pre, intra, and post procedure including grading par paravalvular leaks. The TAVR procedure is performed with catheterization to replace the aortic valve. The first case of successful implementation was in April 2002. Early on, the procedure required a transeptal puncture and the interventionalist would navigate the stent through the mitral valve, often causing severe MR to reach the aortic valve. This was very challenging not only to navigate through the anatomy, but the delivery system was rather large and had minimal steering capabilities. Over the years, there has been many improvements on valve design and the delivery system. Due to these advancements, the procedure can be performed with different pr approaches. The majority of TAVRs are performed via transfemoral catheterization, where the catheter enters the patient's groin, going up through the aortic arch, and is placed across the aortic valve for deployment. Many patients who have aortic stenosis will also have calcification in their arteries. This can increase the risk of vascular complications and limit catheter access, so these patients may require a different approach. Luckily, there are several other access points used today, including transaxillary where the catheters enter through the patient's axillary artery, through the piocephalic artery, into the carotid, and finally the aortic arch to reach the aortic valve. Another is to perform the procedure transapically, where a small incision is made at the apex of the heart and the catheters go from the apex to the aortic valve. Finally, the last approach used is the transaortic, which is the most invasive with direct access to the aortic. There have been three completed trials for TAVR. The first trial, called the PARTNER trial for placement of aortic transcatheter valves, utilized the Sapien Balloon expandable valve and consisted of two groups. Cohort A consisted of 699 patients who were considered to be high surgical risk, according to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, or STS score, and were randomly chosen to either undergo TAVR or surgical aortic valve replacement. And Cohort B, which consisted of 358 patients who were considered inoperable and either were treated with medications or TAVR. The patients were followed for one year and those who underwent the TAVR procedure had significant reduction in symptoms, repeat hospitalizations, and mortality. Some, complica some complications of the procedure included a higher incidence of major strokes and vascular complications. However, TAVR was found to be superior compared to standard therapy for these patients and has become the preferred treatment in inoperable and high-risk aortic stenosis patients. The second trial for TAVR, the PARTNER-2, again using the Sapien valve, included 2,000 patients who were intermediate surgical risk candidates. Looking at two-year outcomes, SAVR, or surgical AVR, had fewer major vascular complications and paravalvular leaks. TAVRs, on the other hand, had larger aortic valve areas, lower rates of acute kidney injury, severe bleeding, new new onset AFib, and shorter stays in the ICU. Transfemoral TAVR had a lower rate of death or disabling stroke than SAVR. There were several mortality rates between TAVR and SAVR, and the trial concluded that TAVR was found to be non-inferior to surgical AVR. A th third trial, the Surgical Replacement and Transcatheter Aortic Valve Implementation, or SIRTAVI, was performed to, co to compare surgical AVR and the cell self-expanding bioprosthesis, the core valve. The trial consisted of 1,660 patients considered to be intermediate surgical risk with an STS score between 3 and 15 percent. These patients were followed for two years and had similar findings to the partner trials, including surgical AVRs having a higher rate of acute kidney injury, AFib, and transfusion requirements. Caver patients had a higher rate of residual aortic regurgitation and need for pacemaker implementation. However, TAVR resulted in better aortic valve hemodynamics and was found to be non-inferior to surgical AVR. There is currently a third partner trial for patients with severe aortic stenosis who have a low surgical risk. Over the years, there not only has been advancements 
assist in valve design, but greater operator experience, leading to shorter times in the cath lab and better patient outcomes. Let's take a look at what parameters are needed for a patient to be a candidate for TAVR. Echo is used for patient selection to verify the severity of aortic stenosis. This can also include stress testing for those with low flow, low grading aortic stenosis or asymptomatic AS. Additionally, ECHO allows us to evaluate the patient's imaging windows. If they have suboptimal tr transthoracic windows, a TEE or transesophageal ECHO should be considered for imaging during the procedure. TEE may also be used for sizing the valve if the patient is unable to get a chest T. Here is an example of a patient with a severely calcified trileaf foot aortic valve and fair imaging windows. According to the measurements obtained by the sonographer, the patient meets all the criteria for severe aortic stenosis, with a peak velocity of 4.7 meters per second, mean grading of 53 millimeters of mercury, an aortic valve area of 0.58 centimeters squared, and a dimensionless index of 0.21. Nearly all patients will have a CT for proper valve sizing. Typical measurements include the cross-sectional area of the aortic annulus, the LVOT, and the aortic valve. The height of the right and left coronary arteries are also measured so the prosthesis or native valve leaflets won't occlude the origin of the coronaries causing myocardial infarction. CT can also verify if the native stenotic valve is truly trileaflet and can quantify the amount of calcification. Additionally, the size of the arteries will be measured to determine vascular access. If the vessel is too narrow, the TAVR will have to be placed using a different approach. Let's move on to the TAVR procedure. As I mentioned in the trials, there are two valves that are used today. Here is the Edwards Zapien valve, a balloon expandable valve that cannot be adjusted once placed. On the right is a cine angiogram of the valve deployment. You can see the balloon expand inside the valve and the the valve cage expands until it is anchored into the aortic annulus. The other valve in use is the core valve, a self-expandable valve that can be slightly adjusted until full deployment. On the right is the cine of a core valve deployment. The catheter is pulled back and the valve expands to adhere to the annulus. And this is what the core valve looks like once fully deployed under fluoro. Imaging during the procedure is mostly done with fluoroscopy. It's the primary guidance for valve implementation and it's used for assessing vascular access and injury. Echo is used in conjunction to evaluate function and placement, to interrogate the severity of any paravalvular leaks and to assess any additional complications that may arise from the procedure. During the procedure, echo imaging can be performed with either transthoracic or transesophageal imaging. When hospitals are new to Caver, it is strongly recommended to use transesophageal imaging until the team has more experience with the procedure and should still be used in patients receiving general anesthesia, high-risk patients, and those with poor imaging windows. It is also critical to have TE as a backup in case complications arise during the procedure. When performing transthoracic imaging for the procedure, the sonographer must have ample experience with TAVR interrogation. Firstly, because the patient is supine, a sub optimal position potentially limiting imaging windows, so they need to be comfortable with off-axis imaging to get the necessary information. Secondly, proper evaluation of the transcatheter heart valve takes a lot of talent for the sonographer. Proper angulation and sweeping through the prosthesis is critical to find paravalvular leaks. And thirdly, the sonographer may have to provide a quick assessment on the severity of paravalvular leaks to the interventionalist or let them know of any potential complications seen on echo. Let's talk a little more about echo imaging during the TAVR procedure. The sonographer should interrogate the shape and location of the aortic valve using the peristernal long and short axis views. Looking at the shape of the stent, it should be completely circular and the circumference of the stent should be fully opposed to the annulus. If it's not completely circular or if there is space between the stent and the aortic annulus, the valve may be undersized, which may not treat the patient's aortic stenosis, or the valve may be, may not be fully expanded, leading to potential paravalvular leaks. To evaluate valve placement, look for any impingement on the mitral valve or if it's above the aortic annulus. 
If any of these situations occur, there is an increased risk for the valve to migrate either down into the left ventricle or up through the aorta. Here is an example of a valve that is smaller than the aortic annulus and may need to be expanded further. Looking at the peristone long axis, it's important to recognize proper placement of the valve. Using TEE, the image on the left demonstrates a valve that was placed too low, impinging on the anterior mitral valve leaflet, whereas the image on the right is placed too high. The valve is above the aortic valve. These scenarios can lead to serious complications, including valve migration, a critical problem during the procedure that is typically only treated with open heart surgery. Next, it's crucial to look for any paravalvular leaks. There is a high mortality rate in TAVR patients with even mild paravalvular regurgitation. Regurgitant jets are typically eccentric, irregularly shaped, and often multiple, so sweeping through the plane of the aortic valve in multiple views is critical. Acoustic shadowing from native valve or bioprosthesis can make it challenging to find paravalvular leaks, especially those posterior to the valve in the short axis view. This is why it's important to use all possible views of the aorta. To interrogate the posterior side of the valve, the long axis views can be very useful. Scanning the peristone long axis, the apical five and the apical three chambers can provide the proper angulation to evaluate the entire posterior side of the valve for paravalvular leaks. Again, sweeping completely through the valve in each view is a must. Here is an example of sweeping through the aortic valve in the peristone long axis. The transducer sweeps from a lateral angle to a medial angle, making sure to go across the entire aortic valve. By performing the sweep, you can start to appreciate the paravalvular leak anterior to the valve. The peristone short axis view is cr crucial in assessing the number and severity of par paravalvular jets. It's again important to sweep through the entire valve plane. In the short axis, the transducer should sweep superior to inferior, going above the valve down through the LVOT. In this view, we can appreciate that there are multiple jets of regurgitation. And again, the apical five and three chambers should be used to interrogate for posterior paravalvular leaks. In addition, patients who have more challenging or lower imaging windows, you may want to try the subcostal short axis to have a better look at the aortic valve. Try to think outside of the box when interrogating, like using the right sternal border to get a different angle on the aortic valve. Let's talk a little bit more about how to grade the severity of paravalvular leaks. While echo is the most frequently used modality to evaluate the presence and severity of paravalvular leaks, there is some ambiguity in how to grade them. This has become a high priority for patient outcomes because patients with just mild paravalvular leaks have a high mortality rate. The Valve Academic Research Consortium 2, or VARC 2 criteria, is a consensus on grading the severity of paravalvular leaks in TAVR patients. We'll go through each of these parameters. First is the circumferential extent, or the percent of the circumference the paravalvular leak occupies. To grade, estimate the angle that contains the jet. For example, in this case, the angle is estimated to be 30 degrees. Then divide it by the full circumference, 360 degrees, and you'll calculate the percent of the circumferential extent of the jet. In this case, it's 8%, which would be classified as a mild paravalvular leak. If there are multiple jets, the circumferential extent should include the sum of all the angles of each regurgitant jet, and not any spaces in between the jets. Be cautious of eccentric jets. If you calculate the circumferential extent and the imaging plane is above or below the vena contracta of the paravalvular leak, you may overestimate the severity of the jet. The second parameter to grade the severity of paravalvular leak is, the inter is to interrogate the aortic arch for diastolic flow reversal. Severe flow reversal is a dense pole diastolic waveform and may even be seen in the abdominal aorta. Third is the regurgitant volume. The stroke volume should be the same across all valves in the heart. However, if a valve becomes insufficient, the stroke volume across that valve increases to keep up with metabolic needs. Therefore, if we calculate the stroke volume of an, the, an aortic valve that has regurgitation, and subtract it with the stroke volume of a competent valve, in this case the mitral valve, then we would calculate the regurgitant volume or the extra volume that passes through the aortic valve. So for example, in this case, we'll use the right ventricular outflow tract to calculate the regurgitant volume. 
To calculate the stroke volume of the RVOT, we take the diameter, which is 1.9, and the VTI, where we pulse wave through the outflow tract, and we get 14 centimeters for our velocity time integral. To calculate the volume, we do the cross-sectional area times the VTI, and we get 39.6 milliliters. We perform the same calculation for the LVOT, um, which we get a, a diameter of 2 centimeters and a VTI of 24, calculating to an LV stroke volume of 75.3 milliliters. To calculate the regurgitant volume, we'll extract the stroke volume of the LVOT, again 75.3 milliliters, by the stroke volume of the RVOT, 39.6 milliliters, and the difference is 35.7 milliliters. So a regurgitant volume of 35.7 milliliters is considered moderate regurgitation. Once you've calculated the regurgitant regurgitant volume, calculating regurgitant fraction is fairly simple. We only need the regurgitant volume, which we just calculated, and that will be divided by the LV stroke volume. Here we get a regurgitant fraction of 47%, again consistent with moderate regurgitation. The last parameter in the VARC2 criteria is to calculate the effective regurgitant orifice. For this measurement, we'll measure the piezo radius at the, and the peak velocity of the regurgitant jet. To perform piezo that depending on the angle of the jet, the apical 5 and apical 3 chamber is typically used. Shift the baseline towards the flow. In this case, regurgitation in this view is red, so the baseline should be moved up to approximately 40 centimeters per second. Measure the maximum piezo radius. Here we're getting a radius of 5.5 centimeters squared. Next, with continuous wave Doppler, we measure the peak velocity of the aortic regurgitation. In this case, it's 3.5 meters per second. To quantify to quantify the ERO, we'll use the calculation 2 pi radius squared, with the radius we measured of 0 0.5 centimeters, is equal to 1.5 centimeters squared, which is then multiplied by the aliasing velocity, which should be close to 40 centimeters per second. In our case, it was 38 centimeters per second, giving us a total of 60. We then divide that by the peak velocity of the regurgitation, which was 3.5 meters per second. Converting to centimeters, it would be 300. 50 centimeters per second, and we get an effective regurgitant orifice of 0 0.17 centimeters squared, consistent with moderate paravascular leak. In addition to placement in any valve valvular leaks, it's important to evaluate the valve for function if it's functioning properly. Was the AS treated, or is there still a grading across the aortic valve? This doesn't mean to only look from an aortic stenosis standpoint. Here is a case where the valve used to have happen to have a frozen leaflet causing valvular regurgitation, leading to placement of a second valve. There are several serious complications that can occur during the procedure, so it's important to look at the whole heart in addition to the function of the transcatheter heart valve. If a pericardial effusion is noted, look carefully to rule out aortic dissection, perforation, or annular rupture, all of which are life-threatening situations. Myocardial infarction can occur if the stent or native valve includes the a coronary artery, or if there's embolization of calcification. And look for any new or worsening mitral regurgitation, possibly due to impingement of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. There are lots of things the sonographer has to pay attention to and requires a high skill level, so it's important to have an experienced sonographer scanning the procedure. Moving on to the follow-up TAVR interrogation. Echo is the primary means of follow-up TAVR assessment and cardiac function. CMR can also be utilized to confirm the severity of paravalvular leaks. Follow-up imaging is similar to procedural imaging where it's important to perform sweeps across the valve with color Doppler to determine the number and severity of paravalvular leaks. If the left ventricle has increased in size or decreased in function, it can be a sign that there are significant paravalvular leaks that may need to be treated. Also, performing serial echoes to interrogate the patency of the valve because over time, like any other prosthesis, it can become stenotic and lead to additional treatment. Finally, because these patients typically have small, fixed, and stiff hearts, it's important to look for effusions because even small effusions are poorly tolerated. When looking at an echo of a patient who has a TAVR, it can be challenging to determine where to measure the LVOT diameter and where to place the pulse wave sample volume. These are both very important parameters to measure the patency of the valve for calculating the effective orifice area and stroke volume.
According to the 2012 expert consensus article from the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery on transcatheter valve replacements, it's recommended to measure the LVOT diameter immediately proximal to the stent, identified by the orange line, instead of at the base of the the prosthetic valve leaflets identified by the blue line for several reasons. First is that there is a less there is less intra and inter observer variability in the measurement making it more reproducible. This is more likely due to the precise anatomic la landmarks used to determine the location of the prosthesis. Instead of using the base of the prosthetic valve leaflets where it can be challenging to determine the preci precise location of the cusps due to reverberations and acoustic shadowing. Second, there is flow acceleration in the subvalvular portion of the stent. Transcatheter heart valves have approximately 5 millimeters between the leaflets and the base of the stent. Therefore, to avoid flow acceleration, the pulse wave sample volume should be placed just proximal to the stent as well. This method for measuring the LVOT diameter and VTI have, been prosthesis, have better prosthesis patient mismatch and correlated better with transprosthetic gradients. Looking at, figure, at the figure, B demonstrates optimal placement of the pulse wave sample volume. C demonstrates the flow acceleration within the stent proximal to the leaflets. And D is placed at the level of the leaflet cusps. So pay particular attention to placement because it can drastically change the calculated stroke volume and effective orifice area and dimensionless index. Lastly, some take home points. TAVR is here to stay. With newer valve designs and greater operator experience and improved patient outcomes, TAVR will become as common in place as surgical AVR. Echo is one imaging modality that can be used throughout the process of getting a TAVR. It can be determined if it can determine if the patient fits the criteria for valve replacement to interrogate the transcatheter aortic valve placement and function during the procedure and for surveillance of valve and cardiac function after the procedure. It's important to have experienced sonographers perform the transthoracic imaging during the procedure to properly interrogate the valve and watch for any potential complications. Making sure to see, sweep through the valve in all imaging windows to rule out or quantify the severity of any paravalvular leaks. And it's important to carefully measure the LVOT diameter and VTI on follow exams, in addition to looking at overall function of the heart. Various complications can occur after the procedure, such as pericardial effusions, endocarditis, and restenosis of the valve. It's our priority to evaluate any complications so they can properly be treated in a timely manner. Manner. Thank you for your time, and I hope this helps provide some guidance into echo imaging for TAVERS.